Gather round, boys and girls, gather round. It's story time. Daniel with Phoenix Solutions here, and for this video, I wanted uh, to tell you the story of Phoenix Solutions and uh, my business, my journey. Um, and the reason that I wanted to do this video ultimately is because um, many of you, as you're watching my videos, may not understand um, why I'm compelled uh, to be self-employed um, and what all has led me to the point that I'm at uh, that, uh, that really, you know, is, are the main motivating factors for uh, what compels me. For, uh, to be self-employed. So I wanted to take, uh, take a moment and tell, tell my story. Um, so that any of you who are out there who might have uh, a similar story uh, might be able to better connect with what I'm doing uh, on my channel and uh, be more likely able to leverage uh, the content that I'm putting out for Phoenix Solutions for your own purposes. So my story starts um, back in 2003. Um, 2003, I was 16 years old. I just turned 16. I had, I was maybe 16 and six months or so. I just got my driver's license. Uh, right after I got my driver's license, uh, my mom comes to me and she's like, you got to get a job. And first thing that I did, very first thing that I did was went down to my local labor works and I signed up with labor works, uh, to go, to go, uh, work out with them. And... Um, I remember, so actually, no, this was like, yeah, this might have been like the month that I got my license. Details are hard for me to remember. All I, what I do remember is that it was, uh, in the cold winter months. And so, I uh, went out there. No, no, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Okay, Labor Works comes a little bit later. First thing that I did was uh when my mom came to me and she told me you got to get a job uh first thing that happened was <laughs> and this dates me quite a bit i grabbed a phone book um because uh in 2003 uh phone books were still a thing and smartphones were definitely not um i remember all of my high school buddies uh were were hip and cool because they had flip phones and that was that was the cool the cool kid thing is to have a flip phone anyway um i didn't um but at any rate i grabbed a phone book and i started flipping through it and being young as i was and uh misguided in you know uh the ways of the world um I really thought it was possible back when I was young to jump right out there and uh, get into a line of work that was, you know, really, um, uh, that would really actually give me some type of self-value, um, something that wasn't your run-of-the-mill uh grocery store or your, uh, uh, fast food joint, what have you. Um, so my first work experience or, or, uh, first experience looking for work was flipping through this phone book. I would, uh, you know, look up golf courses and, uh, you know, find out if they were hiring. I would look up, uh, tech companies and see if they were hiring and I was just pounding the phone book and I was probably putting about two to three hours every day um, into uh, my search for sustainable work and truth of the matter is that 
misguided as I was, I was not pursuing work the way that I should have been. And I think that my stepmother uh, recognized this about me. And <laughs> I think to, uh, in no small measure, did it uh, frustrate her uh, when she was asking me about this. And so uh, about a week or two in, she came to me and she was like, Mel, Daniel, you need to get in your car you need to drive around and you need to fill out applications. And so I was like, okay, I guess that's what you do to get a job. So I uh, hopped in my car. Again, I was still, I didn't, I didn't know how the world worked. So I was still driving around to places that, you know, I thought I'd enjoy working at and filling out applications for these places. Places like Radio Shack, because Radio Shack was you know, around back then, uh, places like, uh, you know, um, everywhere, everywhere, but, uh, your, your, your grocery stores or your fast food video stores and, you know, you know, everything, everything, but what I really should have been. And <clears throat> through cycles of, of filling out these applications and getting rejections, um, I, I finally got to the point, especially being, being, you know, compulsed, let's say, by, uh, by my stepmom to get a job. Uh, I finally, um, you know, uh, lowered myself to the point of, of actually going to a grocery store that was nearby and, uh, filling out an application, a fast food joint nearby and filling out an application. And it would be the grocery store. Um, there's a chain in the Midwest called Price Chopper. If you live out there, you know what that is. Uh, Price Chopper would be, uh, the, 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 the place that I very first obtained work. And the story, it, my story is pretty blasé from that point, uh, uh, forward a uh, couple of years, through a couple of years, you know, I worked for Price Chopper for two, three years. I worked for uh, 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 Burger King, in, local to that area, for like a year and a half. Then I graduated high school, and uh, when I graduated high school, I decided the thing to do would be to move back here to Colorado. So I did just that. And when I got back here to Colorado, things got a whole heck of a lot more interesting for me in terms of, of work. Now, at this point in my story, I need to rewind to uh, uh, before I was um, even working and perhaps some of, uh, you know, uh, my, what, what I'm about to tell you might be perhaps why I had grandiose notions about the uh, type of work that I should be shooting for. Um, you see, I, I have an older brother, and I was watching my older brother as he graduated high school. Of course, he was living back here with, with, uh, with, with, with my parents here. And um, right out of high school, you know, as his very first job, uh, my, my stepdad was working at a tech company, and my stepdad got him a job working for this tech company. And he worked there for like six or eight months. And then he went uh, from there to work at a radio shack. And, and I thought, well, you know, seeing that my older brother had done that, uh, I thought to myself, uh, well, anybody should be able to do that then, right? And that's, uh, I think foundationally why I thought uh, th that I should have a pretty good shot doing that thing. Uh, alas, that was not to be the case. Like, I, you know, I really, really had to grind up. Now, <clears throat> the other thing that you have to understand is that uh, one of the other things that, that perhaps uh, I was misguided about was growing up, um, you know, I, I was watching my mom, and uh, my mom, uh, when I was real young, she had a couple of jobs, like working at Foley's, uh, working at uh, 
a place that uh, that manufactured kites. She had some some here and there jobs uh, growing up, but uh, she would forever change the legacy of our family when she herself went to uh, a local aerospace company, uh, Ball Aerospace, uh, the company that makes jars and cans, uh, one and the same. They actually have an aerospace division. And she, uh, she has always been a science fiction uh, enthusiast uh, for as long as she can recall. And so getting a job at Ball Aerospace was an absolute dream for her because it was in line with that sort of science fiction space technology like it was really neat it was a really and there there's there's a lot that changed about our family as a result of her getting that job there at ball aerospace and uh later in life you know um she would get my my, my dad a job there at ball aerospace and uh my dad is an absolute savant when it comes to all things technical. He's an automotive genius. He, he's extremely, uh, um, he's a genius when it comes to like computers and all things technical. <clears throat> so he was a shoe in there at Ball Aerospace. He actually uh, got in there uh, through my mom into the R&D department there at Ball Aerospace and would actually work up uh, in the company uh, from there. So, <clears throat> with my parents' legacy at Ball Aerospace established, uh, with my, my brother's experience that he had entering into the workforce, I thought to myself, well, I'm part of this family. I have the same you know, uh, mental acuity is my family. I should have the same shot at getting that type of work. And, uh, I, I think I had some wishful thinking going on, um, when I, when I went through my experience and was really, really kind of, uh, depressed about my work situation for, those years, those early years when I was pushing carts and when I was, uh, you know, taking people's money uh, as a cashier at Burger King, um, I, I really, uh, I was arrogant. Um, I felt like that work was beneath me. And these were bad things to be. I really didn't appreciate work and what work is then. Um, when I moved out, uh, and in with my parents, uh, here in Colorado, uh, I was fresh out of high school, and that's where, like I said, you know, things got a bit more interesting for me. I started resourcing work through temp agencies, uh, and that gave me an opportunity for the first time in my life to uh, get employment do, doing jobs that were interesting. Uh, I think some of the earliest uh, of those were, um, I got a job at a company uh, that makes the little ankle monitors uh, that, you, that you put on that, uh, that sample um, your, your, uh, your, your, the sweat uh, off of your ankle uh, and test it for alcohol content. Um, I worked there for 10 months and that was a really interesting gig. I really enjoyed that. Um, I was young and stupid then, so there are some things that I did there that looking back on it, I don't, you know, I, I don't think I impressed uh, the, the people that I was working for. <clears throat> but those were some valuable life experiences for sure. Going from there, I got a, a company, or uh, I got a job working for a company that uh, built batteries for internet servers. That was a cool job. Uh, the company really, really sucked, but uh, the what I was doing was pretty neat. <clears throat> um, 
through the years, I built a resume with some pretty interesting work. Um, and the really important thing to note about this uh, point in my career is that the work that I was resourcing was through temp agencies. And unlike my family, uh, the work that I was getting through those temp agencies wasn't hiring me. Uh, my, my, my family, they would go through temp agencies or by this time, you know, by this time, my brother, you know, had a, had a permanent position at a company. My, you know, my parents had already established themselves at their company, obviously. And so I found myself in this really weird zone where, you know, the conversations that I would have with my mom were, uh, you know, what I should be aiming for is permanent full-time employee uh, status so that I have benefits and, or that I'm eligible for benefits and I'm able to, you know, create, you know, the, uh, um, the American dream, right? Uh, work up to the point where I'd be able to afford a mortgage and, you know, uh, start looking around for a wife and stuff like that. And, um, I took it as, as the years went on and I was, uh, getting more work through, uh, these temp agencies and I was continuously seeing this cycle where, where I'd go work a job at a, for a temp agency for like 10 months and then that temp agency would say, hey, thanks for, thanks for your effort, um, you know, but, uh, this assignment has ended for you, and then I'd be thrust into the circle, and I'd be out of work for, like, three weeks, and then the temp agency would come back to me and say, hey, we got this other gig for you, and then I'd go work for that company for 10 months, and then at the end of that 10 months, they'd flip around and tell me, thanks for your, for your energy and effort, uh, but this assignment has ended, I started taking it real personal. It's, it, it really hit me on a personal level. And I started thinking to myself, what is wrong with me that none of these companies that I'm working for are hiring me? And I just, it hit me really, really personally. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but that was an era of change for temp agencies. A lot of the temp agencies uh, were changing their uh, business model because they recognized that if they, if they established contracts that they knew were only temporary, they knew that they would have a continuous base of, of income. Um, every time, for instance, that a temp agency uh, or, or a company that a temp agency puts someone with hires that person, the temp agency then uh, gets a payout for that individual, but they, they lose their residual income from that individual. So they started changing their model. They started uh, creating contracts that they knew had a, a term limit on them, that those people would cycle back around into the, into the circus again and that they could uh, continue to um, resource and income off of. And uh, my, my family didn't, didn't see that shift, but it hit me. It hit me square between the eyes. And at the time, I didn't know it. I didn't see what was happening. Um, so it really, it hit me hard. Um, and I took it personal because I didn't understand what was going on. So I started, I started pursuing uh, something that I was very passionate about at that time in my life. I started pursuing uh, producing music um, as a potential career path. And unfortunately, very, very quickly into that journey, I got mixed up with someone who... Uh, 
was doing just that um, and seeing some level of success with it, which, which was what was so appealing to me. But unfortunately, in that element, uh, there came uh, a lot of alcohol and drugs. And uh, as for me, like alcohol was a big thing. And, you know, I really started experimenting with marijuana then. Um, but that's, you know, I, I never did get into hard drugs. I mean, quite honestly, hard drugs at that point in my life weren't even in the picture. With who I was hanging out with, none of the dudes were doing hard drugs. It was just marijuana and alcohol. Um, be that as it may, I started really experimenting with that and, and continuing along my journey of the temp agency work and really, you know, losing heart there, let's say, uh, and really just trying to shift my focus over to trying to create a life for myself in, in music. Um, but my behavior changed as a result of, of the chemicals that were coursing through me, and that really, uh, that really started creating concern with my family understandably so, right? Um, so my family contacted uh, a then good friend who himself was uh, pursuing a life of music and um, and cr made arrangements for me to go stay with him. And I ended up, I ended up moving to Nebraska uh, because that is w where at the time he was living and um started uh i moved there with a promise from him that he would show me show me the music industry and he would give me his connections so that i could develop my own in the music industry well unfortunately this would would prove to be uh, a bit of a of a red herring. Uh, there was no intention on his part to get me into show business, or not show business, music industry uh, through his connections and whatnot. There was no intention there. Uh, basically, this was a front uh, that, that he used uh, that uh, my parents had established to get me out of a situation that my parents uh, perceived uh, a, a real sense of danger in. And it worked, uh, you know, I, I got out to a place and what I found is that once I was out there, uh, my experience with this guy is he, he, pretty much, he pretty much came to me one day and said, good luck, you're on your own. And I didn't have the resources to get out of the situation. So I found myself in kind of a tar pit um, a, a metaphorical tar pit, and I was kind of stuck, and it was a good experience for me in a lot of ways, because, uh, the experience made me into a real man, um, um, it, it, I had to learn how to survive, and that's where I learned how to do it, um, and, when I was back there, where I, the, the small town that I was living in, that, that I moved to for this guy, uh, is a tiny, tiny little cow town out in the middle of absolute nowhere, Nebraska. It's called Ainsworth. Um, and there's, there's, there isn't a way to make a living out there unless you're doing something that can... The, the value of which can be resourced elsewhere. Like music worked for him. A lot of people out there in that region who are worth money are running heads and heads and heads of cattle. That's like cattle and corn are the cash crop of that region. If you don't have uh, investment in either of those two things and you don't have another way of making money uh dis locally then then you can't really compete in the economy 
uh, back in that region. And you're relegated to find a life for yourself in grocery stores, in, uh, you know, hotel concierge or, or um, room service. Um, and through the years, uh, living back there in Missouri for the first two, or in Nebraska, I mean, for the first two that I was back there, I was working a grocery store. And I hated the fact that I found myself again in a situation where I was working a grocery store. So eventually that came to an end and I tried to change my situation and got in with the guy who was moving out of the area, which I was heavily motivated to do at the time as well. Um, and we moved for all of three weeks to a, a bigger, uh, quote unquote city. You don't really find city back in Nebraska unless it's Omaha, but, uh, quote unquote city there called Kearney. And I lived in Kearney for all of three weeks with this guy, hoping to change my life, uh, for the better. And, um, found myself at the end of that three weeks back in Ainsworth with him. And so that was really depressing for me. And I, you know, from there, I didn't end up going back to the grocery store industry. Um, guy that I ended up moving in with as a roommate, he was working in the construction industry. Uh, he was working at a lumber yard up to that point. Um, but when we moved back to Ainsworth from Kearney, he started resourcing work. Uh, with a local contractor there and so I started looking around talking about my options through some of his connections I established a connection with a guy who uh, owned a grass seed service um, this guy had a big machine that uh, laid down grass seed um, through a giant fire hose um, you guys might have seen this stuff if you're driving along like and you see like a divided highway and it looks like somebody has spray painted the ground well that's not spray paint it's actually a uh, compound that is designed to uh, yield a high rate of germination of the grass seed that is mixed in with it and that's how they pretty much guarantee that they can put grass down so I was working with this company doing grass seed service for um, uh, quite some time, and there was some interesting work to be had there, but, uh, in the long run, it was, it, I just found that work to be too physical for me, and so I stopped doing that work, and flipped around, and through another connection back there, uh, got into, uh, working with a guy who had a handyman slash, um, um, carpentry business, and this would ultimately be where, where the seeds of my handyman, uh, business model would be planted, um, aside from the various and sundry, um, unique jobs that I had taken on with my stepdad all those years growing up. So I went and I, I worked with this handyman guy there in Ainsworth for three, four years and got an opportunity to do some pretty neat things. I helped this guy build a, a staircase that was built out of the center trunk of a tree and a bunch of half cut logs. And it was all uh, suspended so that uh, the, the trunk of the tree was was ultimately the the main structure of the staircase and um, each step was connected to the step above it and the step below it so that as you walk up the staircase uh, your weight is distributed through the entire staircase and that was a really really neat project to be a part of. This guy was also doing a lot of the raw cut uh, furniture that uh, that you might think of if, um, if you, you'd find it if you go visit visit like an Amish community. They do a lot of this like rough cut 
uh, furniture type stuff. Did a lot of uh, did a lot of that work for him. Did a casket with him. That was an interesting project. Um, just did a whole lot of of interesting other handyman type work with him. So the long and the short of it is, I I really got a whole lot of interesting experience out there from ugly being like grocery store and I was actually working as a as a uh, uh, a room service for a hotel for a while um, but I also through through this carpenter guy I got some interesting or I had the opportunity to do some interesting work too and the grass seed was kind of interesting um, When I moved, when, when I was, when I moved out of Nebraska and I moved back to Colorado, I found myself back in the circuit, right? I started going back to the temp agencies thinking, oh, well, maybe I've grown up now. Maybe I've gotten some of, you know, my, my youthfulness behind me. And now I might actually have an opportunity to get into a company now that I'm a little bit more realistic about the world and really resource good opportunity for, you know, uh, permanent full-time employment because, again, my parents were still preaching this to me. And so I jumped right back in and I went back to the temp agency that I had worked through before and I started uh, working with that temp agency to um to resource uh resource work through that temp agency and um got established with a company that was a pretty neat tech company they were they seemed like they were up and coming and i worked for them for two years it was odd for me after the 10 month mark uh, it, it, it was encouraging that I was still there with that company. Uh, but every month that would pass after that 10-month mark that I didn't get hired, I just started, like, shaking my head wondering. And it was like, what's going on here? And after two years, I had been... After a year of, like, this waiting every month to be hired on... I got disillusioned with that company and I ended up, I ended up just like losing all motivation to really be a good employee for that company. Started hanging out with my buddies there at that job more than I was working. And obviously the company didn't take, take kindly to that, but it was, it was sort of a sort of an eye-opener, right, because, because that was when it really hit me, that it had nothing to do with me, and everything to do with the business model of the temp agency. That's when the dot got connected for my experiences all those years ago, and something, like, all of a sudden, stuff started shifting around in my head and I started realizing that if I wanted permanent full-time work with benefits I wasn't going to get it at a temp agency so I was like I was I was so depressed for like a month I was like oh my gosh and so I'm like all right a big shift has to happen now. And we're talking, at this point, we're talking it's probably 2013, 2014. Uh, 2000, 2012, 2013. That's about when we're talking. So I'm like, all right, I'm done with the temp agency thing. They, they, they are detrimental to my psychological health. So I'm like, I'm going to go do, <laughs> actually, the way that I'm going to frame this is that my, 
my mental my mental position was so damaged by this realization about temp agencies that I was in somewhat of an unstable uh, 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 mental spot uh, with work in general at this point in my life. And I thought to myself, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go do what I consider to be the lowest form of, of generating an income anybody could do. I'm going to go be a salesman. <laughs> Because at that point in my life, um, I was under the notion that salesmen were the scum of the earth. And so I'm, I, I said, I'm going to go be a salesman. Because I was thumbing my nose. I was, I was like, I was like giving, I was flipping off the... 13, 14 years of work experience that I had built up to that point. I was just flipping it off, saying it, it can go screw itself, you know. And so I jumped into the world of sales. And surprised the heck out of myself. To find that it was possible to actually be a salesman with character. And... I started actually doing, I, I had the first few experiences that I had in the sales world were kind of rough. Um, the first few experiences that I had were not promising any, any type of base income. It was all commissions based work. And I thought, well, that's okay. If I, if I get in there and I have good leadership, then I can learn the business and I can go do it and make some money. Well, there are some pretty shady operations out there. Word of caution for those of you trying to go that route. Um, it's a pretty heartless um, sector of work to be in. Um, but that's you wouldn't you wouldn't expect anything less from sales, right? But what I did find was that those first Namely, the first experience that I had in sales was a really uh, important experience for me uh, because I, I learned a lot of good sales technique from that experience. And so it wasn't completely valueless to me. Though I didn't earn a dime, uh, it, it wasn't completely valueless, that first experience. Um... The subsequent experiences following that were a little bit more disheartening, but I went, at, at this point, it was really important that I started generating an income again, so I started only shopping, if you will, for the opportunities out there that promised a base income with commissions. And I thought to myself, if I could get that, then at least if I suck at sales, I have some money rolling in. So I found a, a window company. No. No, that wasn't it. I found a company that was doing janitorial services. Uh, and uh, I went and I got a job with this company doing janitorial services. And I started applying everything that I had learned about sales up to that point. And it was working. I was actually commissioning. For the first time in my life, I was actually earning money in sales. And that was like, that lit a fire in me because all of a sudden I had found something that I could do and I was motivated at that point to get better doing it and and it was that my experience with that with that janitorial service it was good but but um um 
I don't think I was quite on the performance level by this time that they were really hoping I was. Um, I don't think I was generating enough traction that they were hoping I would. Um, so after several months of working there, that came to an end. But I was like, like that gave me something, that experience, right? Like all of a sudden I knew sales was, there was, a, a, <clears throat> there was an opportunity for me to actually make a living in uh, the world of sales. So I went from that experience in uh, to another sales experience working for a steel building manufacturer. And that was an absolute circus show. Uh, that experience, there was, there was next to no opportunity, like, this was a situation where they were handing me a bunch of beat-up material, and, and, like, my job was to, was to generate interest with the clients, and I learned, uh, I actually, I actually, uh, I actually gained one of my closest friends uh, for that era of my life at this job. And, you know, um, I learned through him that there was a, a pretty extreme drug culture at this company in previous, uh, in previous iterations of the company. And that didn't surprise me, given the style of work, given the, given the people that were walking around that place. That just, it just didn't surprise me. So, I, I knew within the first two, three months that that was, you know, just a ride it till the wheels fall off its situation and then move on. Um, when that did come to an end, I went and got another a uh, job uh, for a credit card uh, processing company, and that was, again, another garbage dump of a situation, and I only worked there for, like, a week and a half, and that was, that was an absolute circus show there, too. Went out of there, and I got work at a company um, that was another legitimately amazing opportunity. I got a job uh, working for a window and siding company. And this is where my, um, the real, the, the, the real career uh, in, in sales would begin and ultimately blossom for me. Um, I got into the window and siding company and I was, I was working for that company, um, well, over the years, off and on for, uh, collective three years. And, uh, in the, the, the first two years, the first year was really good. The first year was really good. The structure of the company was right. Uh, the owners of the company had a good commission structure set up. They were allowing us the, the freedom to, to do our craft uh, to, to uh, benefit their company. And everything was just firing on all cylinders, and it was a great experience. At the end of that first year... Uh, due to, uh, some, due to some problems that, that, that our company was having with my direct, uh, supervisors, um, uh, and the, basically that, the, the, the head of sales, uh, there in that company, um, things things would ultimate our house of cards would ultimately tumble down. Um, uh, the one guy developed a drinking problem. 
and he would um, he would have some problems uh, coming into work uh, because of his drinking problem and he was very very close friends with the head of the sales department and uh, for that first little interim the head of the sales department was was covering pretty hard for him uh, but basically um, had to sit down with him and like like bring him back around and say look if you you know because of because of where you're at with this your situation has just changed and basically what he did is he made me the head of uh, the main guy for inside sales and he made this guy uh, head over uh, the canvassing operation, the out in the field knocking on doors operation. And it's a real shame because this dude had a real talent for doing this um, on, you know, on all sides of it. Uh, but the unfortunate thing about the decision that the head of, of sales made with this guy is that he put uh, this other guy in a situation where it would be all too easy to, to, um, um, fuel his addiction, his alcohol addiction. And that's exactly what happened. Um, there were several experiences where the canvassing team would come back into the office about 8.30, 9 o'clock, and he would stumble in so drunk that he, he walked into his office and crawled up under his desk like he was going to lay down and go to sleep there. And I had to call our boss and tell him the situation about what was going on. And, and it just it turned into a nightmare. And that was the beginning of the slow death. Of that experience with that company you know um, that was sort of the end of that first year and so I ended up leaving uh, for a brief period of time but they ended up calling me back uh, that company ended up calling me back a couple three weeks after I left them uh, saying that they had a new head of sales and that they wanted me to come back and work for work underneath her and that was like okay, great, like, you know, I know I can do this, I know I do it well. Well, I came back in and uh, came in underneath this lady, and what I found out is that this lady that they had hired to be the head of sales knew nothing about the game. She knew nothing about what was working in the industry. And... Basically, her methodology of incentivizing um, uh, activity, like like sales and stuff, and activity, was to was to throw parties and like you know really pump up the atmosphere. Uh, she thought that's what motivated her uh, her team. To, to perform at its highest level. And all that was great except for one thing. The company had decided bringing her on to, to cut out the knees of the, of the commission structure. And the problem with that is nothing motivates people like money. The atmosphere can be a party atmosphere all it wants to be, and that's great, that's fun, but you take out the, uh, the promise of money if you perform, and it doesn't matter what the atmosphere is like, you're going to lose out. You're going to lose out on, on your, 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 your performance. And that's what happened. Um, I leveraged... Uh, a a strategy that was already in place uh, 
but it wasn't being used for the purpose of of motivation at that time and w what i did was um every time i would schedule an appointment um there was a big whiteboard that was laid out like a calendar and each day on the calendar if i scheduled an appointment i would put uh the the appointment up on on that so that any time that the owners walked back into the into the sales room they could see what activity was being generated and how the boards were looking well i started leveraging that board uh to uh to motivate the canvassers by putting the initial of the canvasser that brought the lead that set the appointment in and that that worked for a while uh but what it did is it the 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 company didn't much like that i started doing that because uh the company um the person the canvasser that set the appointment with was was under the false impression that if their appointment sold um they would they would get a commission for that sale and the company was trying to play uh, a, a strategy where where at that time if that appointment sold they wouldn't have to or they, they wouldn't tell the canvasser that it was their appointment and they would basically bank on the profits and so the canvassers were were not seeing any monetary benefit of their efforts and their assumption was that nothing was setting and selling and that was just false when i started putting the initials of the appointments up on the board they started recognizing all of a sudden again that that wasn't the case that their appointments were setting and that that bolstered activity with the canvassers again um but then all of a sudden the company uh came to uh saw they they recognized what i was doing and they decided to uh they made the decision to remove the the whiteboard and and started um started having me setting up all of the scheduled uh appointments on a google calendar that was shared with all of the the sales team and the management and that is that was the axe to the neck of that experience so i left that company again kind of at that point thought i was done um went through another three four months of uh three four weeks of uh of circus miss ended up getting a giving a, a brief stint with a solar company it was like a third party vendor for a bunch of different solar companies trying to develop uh interest in certain regions across the united states for solar panels which was a stupid experience that was that was right around like 2000 15 16 that was right right when obamacare hit and um what was unfortunate about that is that when obamacare took effect the sales industry saw an a, a, an absolute surge of of people getting into the game um and the reason for that was that uh all of a sudden People were being told that they were going to be penalized if they didn't have health insurance. And so what they did is, is everybody decided to make a quick shift and they quit the job that they were working at and got a job working for some other company that was promising to pay for health insurance so that they wouldn't have to. And what that does did is it it created this absolute surge of people into the sales industry 
that didn't know the first thing about the game. And there were there was such a flood of people to that game that a lot of companies were absolutely reeling um, because all of a sudden they had to pay health insurance for these people that they were hiring and none of these people had any uh, formal sales training. They had nothing. So what they had to do is they had to come up with a way to make it profitable to have these people as a part of their company. So they're just basically, basically they, they taught companies, this companies that were offering sales positions, just tossed their hands in the air and said, you know what? If you're a, an employee for this company, you're a tax write off. So we'll bank on that. Just sit in the chair and try to get appointments. Commissions just sort of stopped being a thing at that point in time. And so it became pretty clear for me that my journey as a salesman had come to an end. Um, sales was a game that I could no longer resource. Uh, which was devastating for me because I had had this entire experience of work that left me high and dry, got into sales, thought I had found an industry that would carry me off into a career to hit a dead end. And that was, that was a real devastating, devastating moment for me. Um, so I made the decision to stop doing sales at that point in time. Um, I'm trying to think of, of what I did going from there. Let's see. Um, um, it was, it was really in, it was really in the very end, in the nexus of that moment, at the very end of my sales career, that I was reaching out for anything that I could grab onto. And one of my connections from, from the sales world had gotten into a multi-level marketing thing and told me these wonderful stories about all the, the potential that this offered. And I bit onto it because it was something to bite onto. And it directly didn't turn out to be something that would uh, benefit me directly, financially. It actually cost me quite a bit of money. But I found something in that experience. <clears throat> what I found in that experience is the strategy, the real winning strategy would be to get to build my own business and that was when the seed of entrepreneurship was truly planted inside me it took three years from that experience of me just going through the circuit of, of various and sundry other meaningless jobs. Um, trying to find what I needed inside of myself to truly pursue self-employment. Um, to get to the point where, uh, where I was ready for that. Towards the end of that three years, I had a very, very good friend uh, at the time who unfortunately passed away just a, a, a little bit over a year ago now, um, who had owned and operated his company for years. And he was, he was a real smart guy. And he did some pretty amazing things. And I was really close with him. And so 
I was really leaning on him through this course of, of, of three years or so, trying to learn about self-employment, how to do self-employment, how to be self-employed. And had an opportunity to work directly with him, sort of subcontract, if you will, for him for several months. And that was a really neat experience. Uh, very challenging because the work that he was doing was extremely physical. Uh, beyond his own physicality, uh, but he he taught or he had he had developed techniques that would allow him to do a whole lot that a lot of dudes would try to do with brute strength, um, and he got so good at that that he was able to do things that dudes that were just trying to do things with brute strength, couldn't do. Um, he was a real brilliant man. And it was an honor and a pleasure to have the relationship that I had with him for my journey of self-employment. And like I said, I, you know, I worked with him for like three or four weeks, maybe like a month or two. And... At that point, I was so convinced that I had collected enough knowledge, I had changed enough perspective in myself that I was ready to give this a shot. So, I went out there and I tried it. And it didn't go so well. Um, what, I, what I tried to do initially is I tried to go out and I tried to buy things from the dollar store and then sell them at a higher price for a different application. Like, like once I went into a, a dollar store and I bought like $20 worth of candles and then I started driving around to uh, skate parks and trying to sell the candles to kids uh, for, for wax, for the rails, for like three, four dollars a piece. And I thought to myself, if I could buy the candle for a dollar or whatever and sell them at a markup, I'd have a business, you know? But that, it flopped. Uh, it flopped largely. No. There were a lot of reasons it flopped, but one of the biggest reasons was all of a sudden COVID happened. That's when COVID hit. And so I had to flip real quick. Like I needed money to support my mortgage. So I had to flip real quick. So what I did is I got back and I did what I do best. And I started looking around for opportunities again. And was absolutely floored when I cr came across an opportunity to do a uh, driving gig for Postmates. That was amazing because all of a sudden I did have something that I could do to make money that I was the commander of the ship on. What it did is it gave me a platform. Right? It gave me a platform to be a business owner. <clears throat> and so I started driving for Postmates. And I was having the time of my life. It was great. It was, I felt free as a bird. I wasn't making a whole lot of money. I was, I was making just enough money to pay my mortgage. And that was okay with me. <laughs> if I could pay my mortgage, that was okay with me. Although, I got to the point uh, four or five weeks into it where I was looking at the numbers and I was like, eh, it's, it's clearing me, but it would nice, be nice to have just a little bit more so that I can have a cushion. So I was like, what I need to do is I need to find another opportunity like Postmates 
that I can jump into. So I found TaskRabbit. And TaskRabbit was even better than Postmates. Because Postmates was cool because it was my own thing. But I was just driving around a lot. And I was okay with that because it was something that I could do. But TaskRabbit opened up a whole new world for me. Because all of a sudden, I could put a whole bunch of different skills that I had developed over the various and sundry years of experience doing a plethora of different business, uh, uh, you know, uh, different uh, career paths to, to application for. And all of a sudden, the experience that I had with uh, with the handyman carpentry business started coming to the surface again. And all of a sudden, this, the experience that I had developed all those years with my dad working on the various projects that I was working on came to the surface again. And I started really getting a whole lot of activity, a whole lot of clients through TaskRabbit, um, um, for, uh, TV mount work, and never, I, I had mounted my own TV in my condo previous to this, a year or two, uh, but that was the only one I had done myself, um, and the, it's, the way it is now is the way I did it when I first installed it, and it being my first one, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to make it look professional, and so it didn't. Um, so my real concern when I started doing the TV mounts was how do I, how do I do the TV mount and actually make it look professional? Um, so I went on that first one and did it, and thought my way through the project as my uh, business development coach taught me how to do and it came out beautifully and I was so ecstatic I might even still have photos of that first TV mount on my old phone I'll have to charge it and look back and find out um from there I was off to the races um I started I started generating a lot of activity doing TV mounts and then I started getting opportunities to go do furniture builds. And, and that is, is the real foundation uh, of, of my, my business ownership experience. Um, actually built that up. Um, I had... I had a lot of, of clients that were coming to me because there was a, a good exposure rate through TaskRabbit and I was maintaining a 4.8 star uh, rating in TaskRabbit. I had, over the two years that I was working through TaskRabbit, I had eight one star reviews. I had three two star reviews. I had six uh, three star reviews. I had four four star reviews and all of the rest of them were five star reviews. Um, so people were extremely uh, happy with my service. Um, and I even got to the point where, where people would find me through TaskRabbit. I'd go out there, I'd do a job for them, I'd leave a, leave a card with them. I had residual customers coming back to me from that two years. Uh, so I wouldn't have to pay TaskRabbit nothing. I'd go out, I'd do the job for them. And I was really, really starting to build build my company on that. 
unfortunately at that time I didn't feel like handyman work was what I wanted to do my entire life um and the truth of the matter is I still don't I still don't feel like handyman work is what I want to do my entire life um but be that as it may the point is then um I was just kind of starting to become disillusioned with it. And then my, uh, my, my business, uh, um, oh, what is the word for it? My, um, my mentor, my business mentor passed away. And that was, he was a real close friend. And he was my business mentor. And that was a huge, huge emotional blow. And because of where I was being disillusioned with my activity and the emotional impact of his loss, I really stopped being motivated to support my company. And I stopped doing that work pretty much entirely. And, um, it was a real rough deal. It was a real rough deal because, um, uh, you know, I, he was, he was my pill pillar of, of strength. I knew that if, as I was learning how to be a business owner, if I ran into something that I didn't know what to do, I had somebody that I could go talk to directly to find out. Um, this is a good uh, segue, sort of, sort of moment, to pause the story and go back in time a little ways to fill in some more details that are pertinent about Phoenix Solutions. Um, going back to the period of time after I had gotten out of the sales game and was kind of spinning my wheels looking for, looking for a career path, a real sustainable career path forward, uh, something pretty major occurred in my life. Um, in 2018... Uh, a couple of kids were playing with some leftover fireworks in August. And at the time, there were a couple of, there were, there were juniper bushes basically on the perimeter of the entire building. And these kids were chucking some fireworks into the juniper bushes out front of the building. And one of the juniper bushes caught fire. And... Whoosh! Up it went. It just went up in flames. And the entire side of the condo building on that end of the building was completely scorched away. All of the condos on that column of the building were completely roasted beyond repair. Fortunately, my condo was not fire damaged. It was, however, heavily, heavily smoke damaged. And just prior to, just two or three months prior to the fire, the condo community had come and busted a hole in the wall uh, that goes in between my bathroom and the hallway that leads into the um, laundry room, um, because my tub had rotted out, and water was leaking out underneath my tub, and that was subsequently leaking out underneath the wall, flooding out the hall every time I took a shower. So, with that whole thing going on, and then the fire right following that, I was displaced, for about three months 
while a remediation company came in here, repaired the fire damage to the building, and did the remediation work for the for the building. The financial impact of that experience destroyed me financially. I still haven't recovered from it. Um, and in in that in that moment, it came clear to me um, that this what happened with the condo um, was also happening uh, uh, metaphorically on in, in my career life. So when I committed to launching my company, I saw my company as being my lifeline for myself and the means by which I would restore my life from the devastation, the devastating effects of the fire. And so I thought to myself, out of the ashes, uh, a new, a new uh, creature is born. Well, that's, that's a phoenix. That's a phoenix. So I called my business Phoenix Solutions. Um, I've mentioned before on the channel that I... I have religious persuasions, I'm a Christian, that I um, have a personal relationship with my Lord and Savior, Savior Jesus Christ, and the image of the Phoenix is also the image of Jesus Christ. If you, you know, he died on the cross was buried, and then on the third day he rose from the grave. He is the phoenix. My experience is a mere reflection of him. And, and so, just with all of those elements, it became clear to me that my business should be Phoenix Solutions. That's important to know sort of that part of my story uh, because after, after my, uh, my uh, mentor passed away, I, I felt yet another pang of devastation and, you know, kind of fell out of business ownership for a while. And only very recently have I gotten to a point emotionally where I think that I'm ready to to take up the mantle. And I know this time around that I'm relying solely on myself for everything. I'm the one that's going to have to figure out, uh, figure things out when things go awry. I'm the one. But what I have is I have a, a log of two, two and a half years of experience to fall back on. Um, but this time, this time, I'm ready to go further with it. I have, I have bigger plans for what I'm doing with my company than I did back then. And, and I really felt these three, what, three weeks ago when I had $40 to my name, I feel like, I felt like I had a new opportunity to, uh, to, to go at this 
And I felt like it would be hugely valuable for you guys out there to see a man um, in a position where he has nothing but $40 make the decisions that need to be made to propel himself into building a company and I thought it would be hugely valuable for you guys to be able to watch as I go through this so that if you guys are ever in that type of situation yourselves you have a rough outline for how it goes and you have uh you know i do these videos where i talk about uh the mentality of of someone who's in business for themselves because that three to four year gap after i had done the the whole multi-level marketing thing to the point where I was actually ready to to go out there and make money for myself was all uh, me trying to change my brain trying to change the way that I thought about how money is made and trust that there are ways that I, or, or there are resources available that I can resource to go out there and start making money now and work my way into something that is generating revenue for myself to the point that I can float on it all, um, all, all independent of all other resources. Now, we're not there yet, you know, right now I'm using lead vending services as my main source of uh, revenue generation, but very shortly here, hopefully, um, that, should, that should hopefully begin to diminish as I start getting more and more residual work, and then eventually... Uh, my residual work will build up to the point that that will float my company entirely and I will be able to completely rid myself of the residual work. I'd wager that that's probably a year or two out, but uh, um, once I'm to the point of floating my company on, on nothing but residual work and word of mouth, then the next thing that happens is the company builds from there and the more expansion the more more opportunity i have to bring people on to do this work alongside me and build my company up and that is that's what we're shooting for and that's what we're moving to and now i have a way of, of a platform to, to share that experience with you so that you can sort of use it like, like school, if you will, but in an entertaining way, like entertaining school, so that if you're in that, that spot too, you can go out and do all of this yourself and be freed up from from a life that just wants to swallow you whole like mine has um and so to bring it all back around that's my story and that's why phoenix solutions that's why i'm making these videos 
and putting them on YouTube. I hope that there's somebody out there that will watch these videos and see what I'm doing and feel like this is a lifeline for them. And the more I do these videos, the more ideas that I have about them, the better that I get about uh, the better that I get at making these videos. Hopefully, the more entertaining my content will be. Um, and I, I look forward to that day. I look forward to the day that the entertainment value of my uh, content goes up. Um, but the long and the short of it is, uh, hopefully for that individual that is going through something similar, they will be able to grab a hold of this and it will help them get to a point in their life where they're free from it all too. And that is why I'm doing all of this. We've been at this video for nearly an hour and a half. If you're still with me, like, holy cow, wow, thank you for, for watching this video. Thank you so much uh, for having the patience to sit through the entire story. And um, I hope that you're able to draw something from my story. Um, again... I'd love to hear feedback. I'd love to hear your guys' position um, on all of this. And, and, you know, I'd love to hear your own stories, you know. I'd love to hear what you're going through. Um, that's what life is about, right? It's a collective of experiences that, that we all have to figure out something to do with. At any rate... Beautiful people, thank you so much for having the patience with me to tell my story, and I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I hope it helps you in some way. Um, this has been story time with Uncle Daniel of Phoenix Solutions. You guys have a wonderful, wonderful evening, and we will talk to you later.